and uh, chapter 1. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. People, men, have always been curious about the future, and they've always wanted to know what the future holds. And if they're so wicked and uh, so far away from God that he won't speak to them about the future, then they'll go to the devil. If they're like King Saul was, so rebellious and disobedient to where God wouldn't answer him when he wanted an answer, should I go to this battle or not, then uh, he couldn't get an answer. So he went to a witch. And uh, that's where we're at today. See, this, this myth of neutrality that our government is trying to get across on us, that... Uh, the government, the schools, they're all going to be neutral. Uh, that's what they've tried to tell us. They're not going to be for Christ. And they're not going to be against Christ. But Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. They're not going to teach Christianity. And uh, their original position was, but they're not going to teach uh, Hinduism or satanic worship or uh, any of those either <clears throat> but we're finding out there ain't enough teaching yoga and uh, various kinds of meditation now in the schools uh, eventually a nation's either going to serve God or they're going to worship and serve the devil now this Beelzebub you probably remember uh, that Christ was accused of casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So um, uh, that was who Beelzebub was. And if a nation won't worship and serve God, they'll end up worshiping and serving and sacrificing to the devil. And it's going on here in America today, and they're saying it's protected by the Constitution and protected by the laws for them to worship the devil. Uh, you're going to eventually, there's only two paths. And uh, you come to a fork in the road, you go down the one, you're going to end up worshiping Satan. You go down the other, you're going to worship and serve God. There's only a straight and narrow way and a Broadway. That's the only two ways there are. They may tell you you can uh, walk the fence line and straddle the fence, but you're going to fall on one side or the other <clears throat> down the road. And uh, this king did not fear God and did not serve him. And so he ended up going to the devil or sent messengers, go choir of Beelzebub the God of Ekron, and ask him, am I going to recover or am I going to die? But uh, Elijah met him in the way, verse 5. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, why are you now turned back? And they said unto him, there came a man up to meet us and said unto us, go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, thus saith the Lord, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? 
Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he that came up to meet you and told you these things? They said, they answered him, He was an hairy man, <clears throat> and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of an hill. And he spake unto, unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, if I, be a ca if I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again also he sent unto him an another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. And he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came down fire from heaven and burn up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Forasmuch as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken, and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? I looked at the headlines this morning, and maybe some of you saw it. There was a terrorist attack uh, down in Atlanta at the Olympics last night, uh, sometime after 1 o'clock and a hundred people injured uh, at least one was killed if more don't die of the injuries a bomb exploded and um, i was sitting over there thinking about all the recent terrorist attacks the oklahoma city federal building the world trade center building and then this saudi arabia bombing and they're thinking that that twa flight that crashed was possibly a bomb it's more and more likely or even a missile that was fired uh, many of the eyewitnesses said they saw a small flame approaching the airliner just before it uh, crashed so one after another these terrorist attacks well what does that have to do with this uh, Elijah used a little bit of terror here and the scripture talks about knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Uh, you see, not only is that true, we're going to serve one or the other, we're going to fear something. It's human nature to fear, and that fear is going to control us. Uh, if we don't fear the Lord, we'll end up fearing men will end up fearing terrorists god will turn them loose on us he'll turn the devil loose on us and uh we'll end up being afraid uh god even talked about that he said in proverbs he said you said it not all my counsel you'd have none of my reproof so i'm going to end up laughing at you when your fear comes upon you 
I'll mock you. And God will bring that about. And he's doing that. One of our founding fathers said, we're either going to be uh, ruled by God or governed by tyrants. And you can see that in nations. Uh, that's what happened to Germany. Germany at one time was ruled by God. It was the very cradle of the Protestant Reformation. Luther was a German. And the, uh, Germany became largely a Lutheran nation. But then along came these false philosophers. Nietzsche saying that God is dead. And uh, they fell for it. Most of them did. And... Uh, Hegel, Kierkegaard, and these existential philosophers with their false beliefs. And uh, Germany ended up, they were just ripe for a man like Hitler. Yes, sir. Because when you say, well, we don't have uh, the guideline of the scripture, then you really don't have a guideline. You'll, you'll end up saying as they are in America, well, character doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what a politician does in his private life. It doesn't matter if in his private life he cheats on his wife and he steals and he does whatever. It's uh, just his public record is all that matters. As though your character isn't going to affect uh, what you do publicly. But uh, anyway, this story, back to Elijah, before I get too far astray, uh, Elijah, apparently these men, these captains in their 50s, had a total lack of reverence and respect for God. Uh, they, if, uh, think of it this way, if they would have approached the king, uh, they would have approached him the way the third captain of 50. They would have came in and bowed down in uh, respect and fear before the king and they would have entreated him but uh, here was this man of God and they uh, they recognized him they said old man of God but they ordered him come down and uh, they didn't ask him they didn't entreat him they didn't say what do you think about this here they're saying you're a man of God but you don't reserve deserve the respect that we would have even for the king who was a wicked and corrupt king at that time. So they said, come down. The first one said, come down. And, and uh, Elijah said, well, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down and consume you and your 50. Well, the second one didn't learn anything from that. He said, not only come down, he said, come down quickly. So he was ordering around the man of God. And apparently also, these men intended harm against Elijah. Because when the third one comes up, fearfully and trembling, and uh, says, I know what's happened to those other two captains of them and their 50. And uh, he asked for mercy. He falls on his knees and be besought him and said unto him, I, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Precious. Behold, there came down, uh, came fire down from heaven and burned up the two captains of the former fifties uh, with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and... Uh, went with him unto the king. So the angel reassured Elijah. Those other fellows may have meant you harm, but uh, you don't have to be afraid of this one. He's just uh, between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> He's between the king giving him orders, so his life's at stake there, and between this prophet who calls down fire. And uh, Elijah was known for calling down fire. Uh, that's why many scholars believe that uh, he's one of the two witnesses because they are going to have power to call down fire to consume 
their enemy. And uh, that's one of the reasons they believe that. Well, this man, he's, he's in a hard spot there. And uh, sometimes we get in a situation like that, between a rock and a very hard place. Here's this man, if I don't do what the king said, he's going to kill me. And here this fellow's just killed the last two that were in my very situation. Well, that's a humbling experience. And so he humbled himself down and uh, besought the man of God to come down. Well, we're in a tight spot here in America right now and uh, we've got the terrorists turn loose you know we've got the they call it the extreme right wing with their militias and uh, quite possibly some of them bomb the the building there in Oklahoma and they're advocating overthrow of the government and a lot of people lump us with them they just lump the whole right wing. They say, why? Well, if they looked at us and what we believe, they'd say, you're radical right wing extremist. And you're a threat to peace. And uh, you're a threat to the government. And uh, you're extremist. I got to thinking about that the other day. I was listening. I don't listen to him very often. I was listening to a little bit of uh, Rush Limbaugh. And I thought, well, you know, Really, he's regarded as a right-wing extremist. But really, he's on the same slippery slope that the liberals are on. Sure. He just hasn't slid as far down it as they have. And I got to listening to some of his position. I thought, well, if you took him back in time 50 years, right. he'd be considered a radical liberal. If you took his position on feminism, women working and being in careers and women's equality, equal rights. You took him back 50 years, he'd be a flaming liberal. He'd be a feminist. Uh, he'd be supporting what they supported 50 years. If you took his position on homosexual, there was a homosexual man called him. He said, well, I think what we really want is just you leave us alone and we'll leave you alone. But that's a modern way of thinking about sodomy. Back 50 years ago, uh, the states, all of them, 24 states still have laws against it. Back then, Ohio had laws against it. And they, they prosecuted that sodomy as a crime before the law. Yeah. So he's on that same slippery slope, and one wonders, uh -huh. where is he going to be if he lives 40 or 50 more years? Is he, he's going to, you know, if he doesn't stop the slide, he's going to be slid down to where the liberals are today. The thing is, society has moved. It's slid. America has backslid so far to where if you hold on to the eternal truths of God's Word, they think you're crazy. But that's where America used to stand. If you stand where American society stood, where the Congress and the Supreme Court stood a hundred years ago, uh, they think you're crazy. You're so far gone, you're crazy. Uh, but the only way, uh, to make a, a long story short, the only way we're going to avoid that slippery slope that will slide you eventually into hell is to think biblically. The Word of God has not changed in the last 50 years or in the last 100 years. And it's not going to change in the next 100 years. Fact is, it hasn't changed uh, from eternity past. Some people think this word is, uh, uh, some of it's about 2,000 years old, and some of it 3,000 years old, and some of it older than that. But it's, uh, it's older than that. It's forever settled in heaven. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And that's before the creation. The Word was before the creation ever took place. And uh, it's going to be after. Uh, if this nation falls, if it goes on down that slippery slope to destruction, the Word's still going to read the same. If this nation... And some say, oh, it's not going to fall. It's not going to fall. Uh, it's got choices to make. If it can make the right choices, it won't fall to pieces. And... Uh, 
Some say, oh, we're going to win, we're going to win. I don't guarantee that, uh, that uh, we're going to win, but if the Bible-believing Christians don't win, the whole nation's going to end up losing. Uh, the fact is this nation has just traded one kind of terror or one kind of fear for another kind of fear. You know, they said, let's take prayer out of the schools because... We don't want to offend the Jews, and they don't believe in Christianity. We don't want to offend the Jews. That was a lot of it. Of course, also, we don't want to offend the Muslims or the atheists, which they say the atheists are 3% of the population. We don't want to offend them, uh, so let's don't have compulsory prayer, or let's don't pray in schools. But they weren't concerned about, wait a minute, what about offending God? Right. Uh, why aren't we afraid lest we offend God? Absolutely. And that's what has happened. Absolutely. It's interesting, and sometime I'll talk some more about this, but from 1963 when they, uh, they said there'll be no more prayer in the schools, you look at what has happened statistically to our young people and to our schools even academically. And it's right before that time, uh, divorce was pretty much steady and even declining a little bit. Uh, abortion was, of course, illegal and very rare. Teenage pregnancy was, uh, was very rare. And all at once, 1963, all of these things, crime, uh, immorality, sexually transmitted disease, all of them just shot up through the roof. The statistics are there and they show that. And uh, one of the prayers that they said, this is unconstitutional. It was a prayer and saying, God help the students. Yeah. God help our teachers. God help our parents. And God help our nation. And you look at those four areas, what has happened in the last 33 years in each one of those areas. Very revealing thing. It was just a simple prayer. But it was prayed by millions of and millions of students. They said there's about 39 million students praying that. A lot of them weren't sincere. Probably only a few of them were sincere. Uh, the scripture says, God said the tenth belongs to me. And I know that's talking about tithes, but uh, sometimes I think that's talking about people. The tenth belongs to the Lord, and they're holy unto the Lord. And... Uh, uh, this, this is taught that God stated that again and again in Scripture. And even if 10% of them were praying sincerely, that's over 3 million students praying sincerely every day. God bless the students. And God did bless them. In fact, they, uh, uh, America was tops in the world in academics. I just heard this. Uh, recently, that uh, Japan now is tops is way above us academically. Their students are far, far above us. But you know, uh, I didn't realize this. You know where they got their educational system? Uh, General MacArthur. After World War II, he set it up on the American plan, the American plan of education, and. Uh, Set the whole nation up on that. And uh, this uh, speaker was saying they had very little imagination, but he said they haven't changed it in the last 40, 50 years. They haven't changed their educational system. And it's still working just as well. And he said what the Japanese academically, they're at the same place we were in the 50s before we decided we were going to change. We're going to mess with a good system that uh, was the best in the world we decided we had to change it. So we changed it for the worse, and now they're outperforming us in all those areas. But as I said, we're going to be afraid of something. And the fact is that a nation that turns its back on God, they'll end up like this nation going before Elijah. Oh, they'll be afraid of the king, and they'll be afraid of people. But uh, what will end up happening is they'll have so much crime, like you have here in America, like you have just had the terrorist attack down there in, uh, at the Olympics. 
that the people will cry out and they'll say, we have to do something about this. So then they'll actually cry out for uh, a restriction on their own freedoms. They'll say, we have to have a strong, we have to have troops in the street. If we don't have the fear of God and we're not ruled and controlled by the fear of God, then the people will cry out for the fear of man. They'll say, we have to have some kind of control. So the only thing that's left, as uh, another one of our founders said, it's either the Bible or the bayonet. If people uh, reject the Bible, all that's left is the bayonet. And the soldiers will have to be in the streets uh, keeping order because people will cry out for order. It'll be the Gestapo as they had it there in Germany. There, there's going to be one kind of fear or another. David chose wisely in uh, First Chronicles chapter 21. You remember he uh, said, I want you, Joab, to number Israel. Joab said, I don't want to number Israel. It's not the time to number Israel supposed to be done only once every 10 years and uh, David said no go number Israel even from Dan to Beersheba and a matter of fact it said uh, Joab even refused to number the Levites and the tribe of Benjamin because the word of David was abominable that's in uh, first Chronicles chapter 21 and verse Six, but Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. Now I beseech thee, do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And then Gad, David's seer, came to him and said, uh, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Dad, Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, choose thee either three years famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtake thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coast of Israel. Now therefore advise myself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. Uh, this is one of the few times in uh, the scripture that a man got to choose his own judgment. Usually there's no choice in the matter. But uh, God, I think, even in this was testing the... Uh, wisdom of David <clears throat> and a matter of fact another account of this it says God was angry with it. Israel displeased God and God was angry with Israel so God moved I don't know if it said he moved Satan or he caused Satan to tempt David and to tell David go number Israel so that's the way this all came about he said now you got three choices what are you going to do three years of famine well leaders know that uh, if the economy goes down just for one year, everybody's wanting to get rid of them and they're blaming them for it, whether the leader has any fault in it or not. So I think David looked at three years of famine. No, we don't want that. Uh, three months to be destroyed before thine in, thy foes. But David's reasoning was, he said, I'd rather fall into the hands of the Lord. I'd rather face even the judgment and the terror of the Lord uh, because he's more merciful than man than to have to flee before my enemies for three months uh, they wouldn't have any mercy once they found out we've routed them and they're just going to run uh, his best his best option at that point would have been to build him a boat and head out into the Mediterranean just as fast as he could sail uh, because there'd be no safe place for him in Israel. Three months. He said, no, let me fall into the hands of the Lord. I fear God, and I know the terror of the Lord, but I'd still rather fall into his hands than to fall into the hands of men. And so that was the decree. And you know, when God uh, smote Israel and was coming toward Jerusalem, then... Uh, 
he said, make an offering. And God had mercy even in the middle of that judgment. God mixes, and as far as in this world, God always mixes judgment with mercy. Now there's coming a day when it says his wrath is going to be poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation during that time of tribulation. But as for now, God always mixes mercy with his judgment and you know i believe we as the people of god uh, and even when we have to have judgment in the church we should always mix it with mercy uh, you as parents you should always mix your judgment with mercy now if you have no if you have no judgment you're out of balance and you have all if you have all mercy and no judgment you're out of balance if you have all judgment no mercy or or vice versa either way but he's teaching us Mix the two together, and you'll give your children or, or your employees, if, it, if that's who it is, uh, you'll give them an understanding about God because God in this world uh, mixes his judgment. You see that with Noah and the ark and with Lot coming out of Sodom. Terrible judgment, but a little bit of mercy mixed in with it. And uh, if God does that, surely we in this church. You know, even when we look at Christians who do terrible things and they sin and our righteous indignation rises up and uh, we better wait, count to a hundred or count to a thousand or how long it is. Well, wait a minute. And many of the time when I've thought, uh, boy, I'm going to give that person a piece of my mind. But uh, I decided, I learned a long time ago, I'm better off to pray until I get the right spirit. And then I can mix the rebuke with mercy and I can say, no, wait a minute, what if I did that? How would I want them to approach me? And when I get the right spirit and the right attitude, then I'm ready to uh, exhort, reprove, and rebuke. Always mix judgment with mercy. It's up to God on uh, that terrible day of Armageddon. He's going to pour it out without any mixture. There will be no mercy on that day.